Hey friends, it's Matt. You're listening to episode 84 of the Looking Sideways Action Sports podcast. It's the show where I try and uncover the most fascinating stories in action sports and other related endeavours. Thanks for checking this one out, which is another dispatch from my road trip around California in March and April. Now, I know I've been saying this a lot and I dare say it's getting a little bit boring, but tough shit really, because I'm going to say it again. This one with legendary surfer Taylor Knox was a proper pleasure. So we were introduced by our mutual friend Owen Davies. And from the start, Taylor could really not have been more accommodating or welcoming, really. And as ever on that whole trip, I was blown away by the really amazing kindness and hospitality shown to me by me and Owen, by our guests for the show, who, despite not knowing us from Adam, universally were generally happy to open the doors of their home to us and welcome us in. And that's exactly how it was with Taylor, who we went to visit in Carlsbad during the end of our trip. And yeah, could not have been more welcoming and got into the spirit of the show absolutely wholeheartedly. Now, Taylor Knox is, of course, one of the most legendary and influential surfers of the last 20 odd years. A surfing hall of famer known for the explosiveness and athleticism of his surfing. And as another mutual friend, Gabe Davis, put it, his incredibly professional and hard-working approach to his competitive career. Taylor came up alongside peers such as Rob Machado, Kelly Slater, Shane Dorian and Benji Weatherly as part of that legendary Momentum crew who we've uh, met before on the podcast. Like the rest of his friends and peers, this early part of his career was embellished by legendary appearances in Taylor Steele's films and it was followed by a career on the tour that lasted pretty much two decades and topped out with a fourth place in 2001. Other notable career highlights include winning the uh, 98 K2 Big Wave Challenge with an evil-looking Todos Santos 50-footer, a wave that is still legit 20 years later, I think it's fair to say. And now Taylor's into the next phase of his career following his retirement from the tour, and it's this that I really wanted to discuss when we caught up, because his story is really one of evolution and how he's continually striving to be a better surfer, sure, but also a better person generally, and to cope mentally with the changes thrown up by a life and a career in continual flux and under constant conditions of change. That's something that the recent documentary Momentum Generation covered really well. And it's a theme that is becoming surprisingly common in episodes of the show featuring athletes such as Taylor. As we discovered with Jamie Thomas, when you've self-identified as an athlete, for so long coping with the change that comes is a difficult transition and as we're discovering people are handling it in different ways like I say for Taylor his whole life and career has been one long story of ongoing self-improvement and it sounds like he approached it in the same way really really grateful to him for sharing his story with me so openly and honestly I'll be back at the end but in the meantime here's me and Taylor Knox evolution enjoy Got you guys English tea. Like, I didn't even know I had it. <laughs> it's perfect timing. It's a good one as well. It's a good cup of tea. It's, it's organic. Ra- you don't have to panic. It's a, <laughs> it's a rare thing in the States. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how you doing? You good? Good, man. Just uh, keeping busy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What's life like at the minute then? What are you up to? Well, usually in the winter months, I like to stay home. Yeah. Um, it's it's our best time of, of year for surf here. Yeah. And I just love being home at winter. And we did have a really good run through January, like Christmas in January, and then really slowed up in February, which usually is a good month for us. But yeah. Yeah. So was, I'd say it was a pretty good winter. Yeah. You know, I didn't really do any traveling, but now that winter's over here, I'll start to travel some more for sure. Oh, yeah. So what have you got lined up? Well, I've got a trip to the Maldives lined up um, that I'm doing with a friend, Matt Griggs. I've got another trip to Nicaragua with um, Matt again and then we've got a couple I'm, I'm sure that I'll be heading down to mainland Mexico yeah I always generally down there at least once or twice a summer yeah and um, there's a couple other spots I'd really like to go to uh, Peru and Chile are on my list yeah you spent I've much time down there never I've never oh, really? been to Peru wow and, um, I've only been to Chile for that one search event yeah okay so I'm I'm uh I'm kind of excited, you know, like I get really excited to go somewhere new. Yeah, I guess this because I mean, it's a few years since you retired, right? But but it was a long, what was it, 22 years? It's 20 years. 20 years on the tour. Yeah. So 
I guess it sounds crazy, but it's probably a lot that you missed in that time, like the chance to do these trips that you, you know, these kind of fun exploratory trips, right? Yeah, it's, it, it definitely, after 20 years on tour, it makes you feel like sometimes you're on, it's Groundhog Day, you know, like same place, the same time of year, you know, I, you really start to, itching to get like the break the routine. Yeah. You know? And that's why I always love those search events because it was like, we're going somewhere new. You yeah. Know? I got excited. So I think um, that's really what gets me going now and inspires me is going to new places and, and making edits and um, just kind of being an ambassador for Reef you yeah. know, on, a couple, on a few different levels, trying to help out young guys. And yeah, yeah just I want to see, I want to see people in the sport of surfing become really good humans at the end of the day. Right. That means a lot. That kind of really, I think, caps off your careers. To you pa- almost like what to pass on what you kind of learned in your in your right. time yeah i'm willing to share anything i mean i especially all the mistakes they made <laughs> so, right so maybe they won't make them <laughs> yeah well i guess it's it's hard for experience isn't it you know when you've got 20 years yeah under your belt, like it's that is that's a big body of knowledge isn't it to pass on basically yeah i mean it's a unique sport and not not I mean, there's only one other person who's done more than me, and that's Kelly. And yeah. So, yeah, I, I definitely don't have all the answers, but I, I've definitely made a few mistakes, which, you know, I like to share with people, and hopefully they can avoid those pitfalls, you know? I, yeah. I want to see, I just want to see the sport grow in a great direction. Really. Yeah. And how are you feeling about that at the minute? Because obviously it's an interesting time, isn't it, with what's happening next year, and, you know, surfing's about to get like this, you know, extremely mainstream big platform so like a little crossroads period for it maybe how do you feel about that you mean the olympics are yeah. you talking about the olympics? Yeah. yeah i feel i feel good i feel like it's overdue to have surfing the olympics for sure yeah um, i'm a little concerned i think about the wave quality and i hope the waves are good for it because it is our first time giving surfing to the olympics and to the world to watch so um personally i was kind of hoping that they were going to run it in like kelly's wave pool over there or something yeah it seemed like an obvious way to go didn't it it really. did yeah to i mean i same i kind of thought that was going to be the plan really you know because then you're guaranteed and you can control it to a certain degree but yeah not going to happen right <laughs> it's not going to happen so you know i've surfed several contests at chiba before and um the waves can get really fun there but it's um it's just a sketchy time of year for swell yeah <laughs> as well yeah yeah so yeah but who knows maybe they'll just get it epic and it'll be firing and you know i'll be eating my words yeah yeah i hope i hope so so what is it in particular you think when you look back is is worth passing on because you've said a, you, you said like sound like quite specific you know things that you've learned mistakes that you've made that you want to pass on sound like you had a pretty clear idea of of what that would be like this knowledge that you've accrued um god i mean where do you want to start you want to start on the surfing level relationships level um sponsor level there's all kinds of different you know layers there that you're talking about yeah yeah well all all of those things (laughs) (laughs) well i don't know if we have enough time today to talk about all those things because they're all pretty um they can all get pretty deep but just making sure that you know guys you know obviously i'm not going to be you know, giving them love advice, but you know, um, just, just to kind of pay attention and and not get caught up in the hype, you know, and stay grounded and make sure that never that surfing, when surfing starts to feel like a job, then you've got to break that. You've got to do something to change that, whether it's to take a break from surfing or go on a surf trip with your friends or, you know, just sometimes you got to get out of that, that, that mode of being a little bit constantly on the on the ball of working out and surfing and training and in just you've got to you've got to let go sometimes you know yeah like the routine the routine yeah you got to break routine once in a while yeah and and then uh yeah just sharing with the guys like about talking about surfboards or technique um i'm definitely into the whole technique side of surfing yeah I've I've always studied that my whole life, you yeah. know. Yeah, That's, yeah. That was really inspiring for me as a youngster, you know. Right. Because so, I like to watch. I would just watch videos of Tom Kern, and you know, I would just try to learn 
from him. Yeah. Was the best way to approach a wave. Yeah. Because yeah. I thought he looked better than, than most, you know? Right. But, so I liked it. I like to hear where these young guys are, you know, are looking, you know, and what they're looking at. It's fun. Yeah. So that was, if that was something from the beginning then that you were just completely, um, caught on, focused on like technique and how you could apply it to your own surfing. Cause obviously that's what you're kind of renowned for. And, but that was like day one. That was what you were into. That was what you wanted to apply to your own surfing. Yeah. I just didn't, you know, I saw surfers with bad styles do well and, but I didn't like to watch, you know? So I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to, I want to be pleasing to the eye. Yeah. People are going to watch cause that's what I like. Yeah. I don't like just aggro crazy arms and you know, it was different when I was coming up though. They were judging more in length of ride and you know, falling and stuff. So I think our whole momentum generation changed a lot of just surfing technique and where to go on a wave and where you can go on a wave. So yeah, that's, that's what I, and I see these kids now and they're just doing crazy stuff. You know, it's just, yeah. it's mind blowing. Super cool. Yeah. I'm learning as I'm going too. Like I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. learning myself. It's really fun. Yeah. So you mentioned momentum generation. Like that was obviously a huge, I mean, it's a huge release last year, wasn't it? It was a big deal, right? The whole documentary. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was so close to not happening a couple of times or, you know, really? trying to find funding and, um, that whole thing. It's, it's just not easy. Yeah, you know, well, it was a I big mean, project, right? I mean, it was like, a, you know, got the proper treatment, like big budget, like... Yeah, got the big budget. Distribution, and, you know, the, the full the full thing, basically. Right. Yeah. So when did that project first kind of get... Um, when, when did the idea first come up? It first came up... I mean, it took us three years to finish it. Yeah. You know, three to four years. And um, it came up once with a certain director that wanted to do it, and then that fell through because they got another job and then you know the Zimbless brothers came through and, yeah. and really were interested in taking it on and i you know for all of us we're like oh here we go you know like these two guys are going to make our movie that they're not surfers and i think some of you know some guys were kind of like wow are we really going for it and trusting two guys that don't come from our industry you yeah know, our back well, it's culture. a big, big decision that isn't it yeah it is because you don't know how you're going to be portrayed yeah but um well it seemed like there's a lot of trust from you guys in the whole process because it's you know it's, it's supremely honest isn't it you know yeah. on, on every level you know like from for, well especially personally for all of you guys because you you go pretty deep don't you on on like motivations and the history and i, I remember watching it and thinking like that is a lot of trust to go there you know did it, did it kind of take you by surprise like the how deep it went like you all kind of trusted yourself to that process yeah i think it was just you know a little emotional being seen that all a big group of us can trust you know like you know there's you could easily if one guy really had a problem with it yeah you know, it might not where the whole movie might be in jeopardy yeah of course yeah so i think to get that many people on board, it can be difficult. Yeah. And, um, my whole take on it was no one else is really put forth this kind of effort to make this happen. I mean, there was tons of talk about a documentary for the last 20 years, like people saying it should be done and no one actually actually stepped up and made it happen. So I was like, look, who knows if this is ever going to happen? These guys want to do it. I, I just go with it. You know, like, They've they have obviously done big stuff before us, and I think it's cool to see what they come up with. Yeah, two guys that aren't from surfing. What are they going to see in the story? Like, I was interested. Yeah, I thought they brought an interesting perspective to it as well. You know, the way they, the stories they brought out and the kind of arc that they told, kind of was. It was almost like because they had that dispassionate eye, and they were coming out from a different angle it enabled them to kind of pick out, you know, what was really the dramatic story in there, you know? Yeah. They, they told me they had so much good footage that they had to cut some out that they were pretty bummed about. Right. You know, like, um, they said it could have been easily like a mini series. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, well, in the archive as well, I mean, you know, that looked like a crazy amount of work on its own. Oh my God. I think it said that they went through 3000 hours going through Taylor Steele's old footage. Yeah. 
I mean, it was just hectic. They yeah. had 500 pounds of videotapes from them. Eyes were bleeding. <laughs> no, yes. No and doubt. Whoever was in that, that bay was probably so happy to be done with our project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, did you surprise yourself with some of the frankness that was in there? Because there was a lot of pretty, pretty honest stuff, especially about what I found really interesting is one of the things I talked to Rob about when I interviewed him was like, there was almost like this realization when you all got to a certain age that perhaps your career wasn't going to go the way that you kind of thought it might. And that, you know, I think there's a couple of quotes where it's an acknowledgement of like maybe the competitiveness that's required to achieve ultimate success, you know, isn't quite there. And that was really pit pitilessly honest. A lot of those conversations that you guys kind of put on camera, like how did you feel when you watched that? Mm, felt felt like it was good. Like I, the more honesty, the better the story. I think. You yeah. Know? The more credibility to it, and I, I there were some things that surprised me. Just choke, you know, really choked me up to watch Jeannie Chester's interview. It was it was, yeah. it was really hard, and then you know, then you got Janet and Pat, which God, what a beautiful couple. You know, on the end of the movie, super funny with those two. And, yeah. Um, it was like we had this period of time. I think of it was close to a decade where we were making movies and pe everybody was doing well. And it was just so much fun. We were just, you know, we were riding high. And then as people got older, things changed a little bit, you know, things got a little more serious. And, and I think there was a little bit, I mean, for me personally, anyway, there was a little bit of like depression of like, wow, the band broke up, you know, yeah. like everyone started going their own ways and life happens. Yeah. Like, it was a natural progression. You can't expect things to stay the same. Yeah. You know, but it still was like, it was so fun when you think back on all those memories of yeah. us when we were all traveling together. It was just, it was classic. You know, you're in your 20s and you're traveling the world and you're getting paid to do it. And, yeah. you know, it was just like, what could be better? Proper golden age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were like competing with ourselves. Like, it felt like we were competing against ourselves and really no one else. Right. Which, probably is what drove it right right I which mean, also came across like that kind of you know friendship but competitive rivalry you know told that part of the story really well yeah there was and then after a period of time i think once if you're competitive with a person after for a certain amount of time there will be some adversarial moments yeah it's just i don't know how you avoid it yeah you know i mean it's part of friendship as well right you know, whether you surf it or not. I mean, if you've got that close knit friendship, which you guys obviously have, I mean, it's, it's almost part and parcel, those kind of little conflicts that, that become part of it. Right. Yeah. That's it. I mean, you're going to come, you're going to disagree and trying to hold together a group of 20 to 30 friends. Yeah. I mean, there were literally 30 of us when you go down the ranks of, you know, some guys that weren't even in the movie, like Conan Hayes and Greg Browning and, you know, like guys that were there every step of the way as well. And we just had so many good times. It's cool now. I mean, everyone in that group is doing well. No one's gone off the, off the rails. Like, yeah, everybody's still friends and loves hanging out with each other. So yeah. Well, again, when you get a bit older, you kind of, you forget, don't you, what it was about, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, in a lot of ways you kind of like, Oh yeah, I do like that guy. You know? <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of, I'm sure there was some, some petty stuff that was going on back then. That yeah. Now you just, it's great to get together. We just laugh about it. Yeah. So you mentioned that when it ended that period, it was depressing, you know, in a way, was that just because it signaled a, a change in y your life? You know, like the, that, that period was over and you were moving into a new part. Yeah. There was a, it was an accumulation of things that, that, but that were hitting at the same time. Um, you know, I was, I was about to have a son Everybody was getting into different relationships. Some people were getting married. Other people were having kids. Some people were breaking up. Taylor Steele wasn't didn't want to do the, the surf movie thing anymore. Um, and that's what we were used to for so long. You yeah. Know? It was like, who could make the better part yeah. in the movie? You that know? was what it was about. Yeah. And that's what we love to do. Like, yeah. I love that more than I love the tour. Yeah. So, and then it's just, just to have it gone to like, think like, oh man, that's, that's just not going to happen anymore. Yeah um that that was hard i think for a while yeah you know it really because taylor's movies really brought us all together and brought that it just raised the level of surfing yeah because he could just pull together 
the best surfers in the world and go on a surf trip. Yeah. And they would come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then... They would just come. Like, no one said no. Yeah, and then document it, and it's groundbreaking, basically. Yeah, and then you got those four or five guys on a boat in Indo pushing each other. Yeah. You're going to get some pretty damn good surfing. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, you're going to... We would go over fire coral to win a part, to beat each other. <laughs> he didn't care. You yeah, know? It was yeah. was like all out. Right. <laughs> so how did you cope with the change? Like when, when you kind of, because presumably you had to act to make it positive. I think we all kind of just went off into our own separate worlds. You know, we stopped hanging out with each other and started just kind of looking at close surroundings like, my your your little world everyone w worlds weren't merging anymore yeah it becomes separate and it was like you know i've got a kid now like i've got a i can't hang out like i used to you yeah know? like you've got responsibilities <laughs> yeah i've yeah. got responsibilities yeah, now yeah. And people, but it, it's hard though i mean everybody has to go through that right you know yeah i think everyone does yeah it's just, it's just growing up yeah you know and I, I don't regret anything i don't think I wish I had better tools back then to deal with it and a better way to look at it. Yeah. Well, I guess that's what I was kind of getting at, really. Because, you, again, you, as you get older, you develop these tools, don't you? These kind of ways to cope and understand the changes that are going on. So is this kind of when this started to happen for you? Yeah. I mean, it was actually a few years later. Um, you know, I think I, I withdrew within and got my made my world even smaller just because, you know, like I said, I was having kid and then i two years later had another kid yeah and so it was like these are huge changes you know like i didn't i was trying to juggle so many things being on tour and dealing with feelings and guilt for not being home you know it was just doing my head in really. right yeah okay and how long did that period last then <laughs> until like until the day i retired really yeah right so that battle was kind of constant to to juggle those things I mean, when I started doing meditation 20 years ago, that's really when things started cr like chilling. I started understanding some of my own behavior because that's, that's what I was looking for. Is like, why am I making these decisions? Why do I feel this way? Like, you know, I really felt like I had all the answers I was looking for. Yeah. Just couldn't unlock them. Right. I was being blocked from them. Okay. So it was more of like, I wasn't looking out to anyone for the answers. I was just had to like go within to kind of find out okay like this is this doesn't work for me but yet i keep doing repeating this pattern of behavior right <laughs> so i wanted to know why right and then i wanted to stop it yeah so what were those patterns of behavior just things that you knew were making you unhappy ultimately and well, you couldn't stop doing them you know i mean it's just if you're going to do a job and if you're going to and your job is to travel uh, whether you're an airline pilot or whatever it is yeah you just kind of come to terms with like, it's really about quality over quantity. So when I realize that, you know, if I'm with my kids and I'm giving them a hundred percent of my attention and really being there with them, being present, yeah, being present that way when I am traveling, I feel better about it. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. So what did the meditation give you then? Cause it's a particular practice that you do, right? Yeah. I do the Keely meditation and it's um i would say it just it's giving you a road map to your mind and why your mind works the way it does yeah and realizing like well i've been doing that my whole life but i just realized my whole life that hasn't been working for me yeah so i, I want to you know get rid of that sure i want to look at it see where it, and then also you can trace back to where it came from you know oh well, grandpa did it then my dad did it yeah and now here i find myself doing it yeah <laughs> those know. patterns of behavior yeah, yeah that just repeat down through generations yeah they really are aren't they because well, it's learned behavior isn't it basically yeah. you know did did being a parent kind of underline that as well a little bit did you begin to recognize that more yeah you 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 know i took my parents i had great parents and you know but you take i think every parent's dream is that your kids are going to be a little bit better than you yeah you know you kind of pick the eyes out of it but a lot of times you know you just grow up and unconsciously you hear the same thing over and over since you were born and then you just grow up to believe it yeah it's yeah. amazing how it affects you on every level as well and as you get older how you you start to see it on every level you know you're like 
yeah, that's why I do that. <laughs> yeah. Or basically, you, you know, there's something that your, your dad did to you that you really didn't like. Yeah. And then you find, you see yourself starting to do the same behavior again. You're yeah. like, wait a minute. I hated this when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. Why am I doing it? But yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's, but it, it is learned, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, so the meditation helped you understand that. Understand it, unlearn it. Right. Okay. You know, let it go and just like, what what do you want to take forward? Right. And what do you want to leave, like leave behind? Can you explain a little bit more about the actual practice? Because I don't I don't really know a lot about that form of meditation. Sure. Well, basically, when it, if I was to start you in the meditation, I would say just kind of feel the top of your head, right? Consciously, um, you can even touch it up there just for a second, and then you know you can touch it, and then you remove your hand. You can still feel where you touched it, so it's a feeling sense. And then if you kind of imagine a horizontal line of plane of energy that kind of comes down through both hemispheres of the brain until you hit um, like eye level, which will be your middle self and your conscious awareness kind of resides there. And then you stay there um, for a few minutes. And then after a few minutes or a couple of minutes, you start to drop down into uh, what we call the, the greater Keeley, which is down in, in, I guess, the area of your heart. So basically, I, I, I would ask someone like, see, when you see a good friend that you haven't seen in a long time, that you really love, you get that feeling that wells up within you. Yeah. Right? Which that's, everyone can recognize, yeah. And that's coming from an area, yeah. right? Welling up from within. Yeah. And then, it's a tangible emotion, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what I've learned is that when I make decisions from my heart and not my head, they're never regret. Right. And that helped you understand that more yeah basically yeah and how long i mean i've dabbled with meditation but never really managed to stick at it really you know so how long is it it's a 10 minute meditation but is it did you have to how long did it take before you could like actually see the effects and the change that you're talking about well for me i, I was a little bit slow it yeah took, it took me like two months right because i was I'd close my eyes and I would have thoughts running through my head. Right. Like, what do I got to do tomorrow? Like, yeah. you know, like, and I couldn't stop the hamster on the wheel up there. The monkey mind. Yeah. Yeah. So it took me a little while to kind of get that chatter to calm down. Yeah. And it's like when people say they lay in bed at night and they're like, oh, I can't sleep. I'm just thinking the whole yeah. time of what I got to do tomorrow. What Your I brain's gotta... spinning. And you're spinning. That's, yeah. that's what I wanted to stop. That's why I started doing this. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah. And that's what enabled you to kind of control that, basically. Well, yeah, I guess you, the word control is okay, but it's more of like letting stuff go. Right. Like it just really wasn't a part of you. I don't believe any anything negative that someone says or does is actually from their true nature. Yeah. It can come from insecurities or it can come from anger. Fair. But, you know, what comes from someone's true nature is never going to be negative. Right they're just they're just pulled off center yeah and so they're coming from what we would call like a compartment okay so a compartment would be something like um energy let's say i don't know how to explain a little bit like this but like let's say your mom forced you when you're a little kid to eat broccoli every you absolutely hated it yeah and as you you're an adult you hate broccoli yeah you know what i mean yeah like, yeah that's a compartment. Okay. Yeah. And and the association again, basically. Yeah. Right. Wow. So that helped you find a, a, a more level place then, basically, as you got older. It enabled you to kind of process the way you were feeling and move forward positively by the sounds of it. Yeah. Just, just to, the whole idea is to be present. Yeah. Wherever you are. Yeah. And not to live from the past or not to live for the future. Yeah. Did that affect your surfing positively as well? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. My career was, I would have been over a long time ago. Really? That's yeah. that what I was going to ask, really, because I guess if you were having these feelings and the tension that you describe, there, there must have been a temptation to, to change it on that fundamental level and maybe, you know, quit the tour or like just change that up as well. Yeah, there was a year, and I, I, the year I got second to Andy in Mexico, the search event yep. at the bar event. Um, I was going to retire that year. Right. 
And what was what was causing that this this feeling that you described? Getting, I felt like it was Groundhog Day, right? On tour, and I was getting bored. And how far in were you at this point? Uh, how that was early two thousands, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I stayed on tour another decade. Yeah. From that time, right? That I was going to retire. So you were seriously considering it? Yeah. Right. No, actually, yeah. I told a couple of people this might probably going to be my last year. Right. I was just feeling like my surfing was. I was surfing for other people, and I lost my way a little bit. You know, because surfing is so incredibly special to me that I I would never want to surf purely for ratings or money. I mean, it's it's soulless to me. You know, yeah. I I think, I mean, what could be? I think for me, being on tour made me the incredible, like a the closest thing to a soul surfer I could become because I put all my eggs in the one basket. When I was a kid, I said I love surfing so much. Like, how am I gonna stay in the water? How can I do this? How can I pull this off? Yeah. And the only way to pull it off and be in the water as much as I wanted to be in the water, which was all day, every day. Every day. <laughs> was to be a pro surfer. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, I was going to go get a construction working job and yeah. I wouldn't be surfing all day, every day. Yeah, now, sure. <laughs> so that was the motivation. That's what you, you were all in. You were like, right. I'm, I'm gonna, all in for the I'm lifestyle. Gonna, I'm going to throw myself at this. Yeah. yeah. Right, but then as because you you said you used the phrase surfing for other people. What do you mean by that? It's a really interesting way of putting it. Um, well, just you know, surfing to get like uh, recognition from the outside world. Yeah, like like external motivation yeah. rather than like the internal drive that presumably when you were a kid was what you know. Yeah, the reason I started surfing when I was you know nine years old is because i just loved it so the ocean so much yeah had nothing to do with the jersey or yeah i had no thoughts of being a pro surfer that was the furthest thing from my mind yeah yeah it it morphed into that right but i was i felt like i was getting further and further away from that kid and it was bumming me out (laughs) were you were you tangibly aware of that was that something or or was it more a feeling that's the year i became aware of it like i started surfing for myself again yeah and that's why I stayed on tour. Yeah. Um, because you were able to reconcile like, like yeah. and get back to the way that you wanted yeah. to feel about it. Yeah. I just wanted to feel like, like I did when I was a kid. Yeah. The pure love of being in the ocean. Yeah. It must've been a relief. It was, it, there was also the mix. There was also thrown into that. Uh, like Rob wasn't on tour anymore. Shane was getting off tour. Like he was off tour you know, some of my friends were like not on tour anymore, so the tour was becoming less fun. Yeah, right. You know, yeah, like I was sure. like, I was losing <laughs> friends, and I was like, God, they're all going in different directions. I think Kelly at the time, um, right around that time, he took a couple years off the tour, and then I, you know, I the, one of the things that really helped me too was becoming closer to Mick Fanning. Right. And uh, yeah, because you guys are big mates, right? And yeah, we're. I mean, he's definitely one of my closest buddies. Yeah, that I have and. Getting to know him really re-inspired me about surfing, you know, like right. it was cool to be being pushed by him, starting traveling with him because I, I really traveled alone most of the time. Right. So that kind of that also that new relationship also helped reinvigorate it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. He's a fun guy to be around. He's, you know, he's motivated. He's he's just yeah, he's, he's what you call best friend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You mentioned earlier that there's the tension only really, you know, the, the the balancing act that you had to juggle only ended once you retired, really, you know, even though you learned to manage it, like by the sounds of it. Was that one of the the reasons behind the decision to retire? Did you just kind of think, right, this it's right, it's time? Yeah, I mean, I just, I kind of wanted to stay in the game until I became at peace with what was plaguing me about being on tour. Okay. Um, I wanted to like turn over, uh, overturn every stone. Okay. And just because I felt like if I didn't get through that, I would have left the stone unturned. And you would have regretted that. Well, it's just good. I just something I wanted to know about myself. Right. Um, it didn't really mean anything to anyone but me. Yeah. Just, you know, nobody... Nobody was thinking about that, I'm sure, but me. Of course, yeah. yeah. So it's an internal thing, isn't it? It's like it, how you... It's, it sounds like it's about finding internal happiness, right? Yeah, it's just... Be, it's Like I said, it's becoming... Just getting to a point of being at peace with your decision and knowing that you're, you know, you're not a bad father because that was your choice of your career. You yeah. Know, that was 
my career choice a decade before or actually a couple decades before I even had kids. So and in my belief is just my personal belief is that you choose your parents from the other side. So I'm 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 kind of feeling like, you know, they they knew coming in what I did. <laughs> <laughs> they knew what they were getting to. Yeah. yeah. But the but, tour was the arena to do it. The the tour was still the arena that, that to explore these issues. Because you could have, you could have presumably retired earlier and still work this stuff out. So it sounds like it was quite linked to the to the actual role that you had as a competitor. Yeah, I think what, where my competitive nature stood and really, like I dug my feet into and loved so much. The only competitive I didn't really, you know, you'd ever really love beating people. I mean, especially since half the time I was competing as a friend. Yeah, you know, you see, you beat a friend and you know you're happy obviously but they're not happy and there's all those things of like oh man you know like but with taylor's thing like with taylor Steele's movies and stuff it was like we all won yeah like nobody you didn't have you you was a good competition like a it was inspiring like you you would go out and try to surf your best and have the best part in the movie of course yeah but everybody gained but everyone gained and it wasn't like you were like snaking them and yeah. holding them off waves and stuff like that. You sure. know, like that part felt a lot better to me. I was really inspired to have good video edit movie parts. Yeah. Um, so did this, this relationship with your own competitiveness that you describe and was it also something that you learned about as your career went on? Yeah, it changed. Yeah. You know, it changed from, like what what i'd be caring about what who where i was rated to just becoming i really love like i said i'm i'm totally into making my surfing better every year like yeah i want to be the best 50 year old surfer in the world when i'm when i when i'm 50 someday yeah you know that kind of that's what inspires me now yeah like you know learning aerials at this point in my career would be awesome i want to try that <laughs> you know like you know it just looks fun yeah you know no one's ever gonna you know, I'm sure the uh, air show invitations will be raining down on me, but <laughs> <laughs> but for me personally, that would be it would be something cool, yeah, something new to learn because yeah. surfing is is you're never going to master it. Yeah, it's like you just won't. And there's like I don't care who you are, like even I'm sure Kelly thinks the same way. Like there's things that he could he sees and parts of the wave that he can go to that you know we all think that way. Like that's what drives us to become better and better and stay on top of our game you know and then as the age thing came in for a while people would be like oh you're the oldest on tour and it kind of bugged me and then it became kind of cool like yeah like you know accept the age you are like yeah it is what you it it is what it is and just try to like blow people's minds based on your age and what you're doing yeah why did it bug you then when people said that I don't know. I just didn't. I think for a while there was there was always a um, stigma, especially when I was a young grommet. You know, like guys like Martin Potter and Tom Kern, they all like were done at twenty nine thirty. Yeah. The Which industry cr- once once you turn thirty, the industry said you were too old. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely crazy to think about that. I know. It? It's just it shows you. It's a classic example of a compartment. Yeah like a pervasive one that's across the entire industry yeah i mean that's just that's how just it is so stupid to think that 30 was old like i'm pissed because like i missed i feel like i missed years really good years of tom kern like really good years of martin <laughs> potter like all these aki like well aki came back and you know he he restarted his career and won a title which was insane but like it's just it's just dumb thinking yeah you know, it's just, and now, you know, you look at guys and what they're doing and how old they are and it's, they're still surfing amazing. Just like really, really high levels. Yeah. Did you, did you personally struggle with getting older or, I mean, it sounds like you got a pretty good, you've always had a pretty good handle on it, but cause, but you know, as you, as your body starts to change and your mind starts to change, it can be difficult to cope with that. Yeah. I mean, it can be. I've always stayed pretty healthy and tried to be, you know, stay on top of my game in that way. And but yeah, as you get older, you've got to adjust the game. You've got to adjust your schedule. Like, you know, I used to work out like a, just a madman with these huge workouts. And, <laughs> and now it's more like just sustaining what I have, you know, like I don't really need to become a more powerful surfer. I'm powerful enough. Like it's 
it's different now. You know, yeah. it's like mobility and in a core strength, and you know, it changes. It's it's what keeps me in the game. It's fun, and it's there's always something new coming along to try some, you know, training technique or body work, you know, and some of it. It works, and some of it down the road you figure out it didn't work. But yeah. that's what I love. I love investigating and trying th- new things like that yeah. on those levels. All oh, right. So, so have you always done that? Have you always yeah. kind of tried dabbled with different things and and taken a quite experimental approach to it? Then yeah, right. From okay. when you were from when you were young, I've always done that. Right. Yeah. Okay, and that's evolved as well. Yeah, that's it's it's evolving constantly. Right. There's, there's so many new things that are coming through my like training. Like where is it? Whether it's a the trainer that I've been working with for 15 years, or DNS, or you know, foundation training, there's just so much. Yeah, and what did you find when you was that? Because I guess when you're a kid and you like you're as amped as you describe, was was that what helped to drive it? You were like, I need to maximize this opportunity, so I'm going to try everything to kind of see if I can make it. Yeah, I just didn't. You just don't know until you till you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I can't say something doesn't work if I didn't try it. Yeah, and I can't say something does work if I didn't try it. Yeah, yeah. Do so you I need mean, to try it? I mean, there's, I don't. You there's one thing you can't buy in this world, and that's experience. Yeah, hard fought, especially after a twenty year career. So when you when you made the decision, how did it feel? It felt good. I actually was ready to make it probably a couple of years before I did. Yeah. But my sponsor at the time was, um, they were a pretty competitively based company. So, you know, being on tour was really important to them. And yeah. um, I wanted to do more of the travel kind of thing that Rob had been doing forever and yeah. go into that route. So luckily it was perfect timing with Reef, you know. Um, I was writing for them for shoes and they just decided like, you know let's pick you up 100 percent, and yeah we're into you traveling as well and doing surf trips and you know being more of a free surfer which yeah was which what i is what i wanted to do for a couple of years yeah so you, you must have been pretty excited yeah i was i'm still <laughs> excited it's yeah. still happening so yeah it's um i do i get really excited and i try to take that kind of work ethic and almost the contest like I, I love just making edits and going to, off to a country and, and I don't need now to be around 40 of the world's best surfers to be highly motivated to surf good. You know? Right. I could be with one guy and that'll be plenty of motivation or I could be alone. Yeah. I've always been a person that's, you know, eat with or without people. My inspirational level doesn't really waver okay. or wane. Right. You know? But I mean, I do love like when I do an opportunity to go on a trip with Mick or something, it's, you know, I do love watching him blow the, t- you know, blow yeah. his tail out in front of me and it gets me all fired up and pumped up and stuff. So, yeah. So what have you got? Um, what ambitions have you got for it? It sounds like you're still as hungry as ever. Like what, what what's the plan? What? I they'd get better, you know, just I've keep kind of, improving. Yeah. Just keep improving. I had a little bit of a knee surgery about nine months ago and kind of still coming back from that. And yeah. Yeah, I'm just really looking forward to getting back to my old self, you know? Yeah. Uh, so when you look back over the career, what stands out as as a highlight? Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a lot there, isn't there? <laughs> it's you know? a lot there. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I'm talking about the competitive career, really, you know? Yeah. Like those 20 years on the tour, like what? I guess, you know, winning the ISGA Games, um, winning my first WCT, uh, winning the K2 Challenge, big wave thing, was, yeah. it was big. Um Getting second and borrow with Andy. It's yeah, pretty ma- the ways were just so magical. I was gonna, I was gonna use the word magical. Really, it must yeah, be a beautiful was, memory. It was. It was like, and I know people that go down there a lot and that live there, and they've never seen it that good before. Probably will never see it that good again. It was. Yeah, it's pretty special. Yeah, special occasion to look yeah. back on. Yeah, you're also pretty busy with a lot of kind of extracurricular stuff, right? You know, you have other interests outside surfing. Is that something you've been able to? spend more time on yeah definitely um you know i like to go down and, and help the kid like we have urban surf kids which is a foundation that brings foster teenagers out to the beach and teach you know we get them on waves and yeah 
which is really special. And then there's a foundation walk on water that works with getting autistic kids in the water, you know, I do it down and help with some of their events. And yeah. Um, you were saying you do some stuff with waves for change as well, right? Waves for change, Tim down at waves for change doing an amazing job, especially with, you know, um, a culture that he's working with down there, the indigenous culture, which was never really a water about water yeah. in the ocean or didn't anything. Have the, didn't, didn't grow up with the, the kind of they didn't grow up with anyone like getting them out there. Yeah, like not even any reference points really, right? No, to relate none at to. All. Yeah, and you see where these kids are living and stuff, and you're just going, wow, like this is crazy. You know what they have to deal with on an everyday basis, and where what Tim's doing down there, it's just it's been phenomenal. I mean, that's a life changing thing. I mean, it's a big thing to take on for him. Yeah. Which has been super inspiring and, you know, something that like, obviously I couldn't do now that cause you know, I've got three kids and I live here and it's, just, yeah. but, um, I can help out in the little ways that I, I can help, you know, I try to be involved and in just more stuff like that, you know, surf rider stuff. We've got, you know, I've worked, I remember in the mid nineties, I was, I was sponsored with by Goal Wetsuits for a few years. Yeah. And I would get flown over there and I'd do that contest at Cornwall, that QS they used to have there. And Oh, what, down in Fistral? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you've done, you've so done like some nine, time at Fistral. Yeah. 96, <laughs> 97, 98, 95. I was there. Um, Did you go to Sailors? I've got to ask. The, I was night, doing the nightclub. <laughs> I remember Sailors. <laughs> I was doing stuff back then. I remember it's just when Surfers Against Sewage started. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, that yeah. would have been right around the time that it was you just know. beginning. Yeah, yeah. I remember we went to Wales and did something for them during that time. Oh, wow! I didn't know that. So it's it's cool, like to think back, like wow, I was there in the beginning, and now they're they're thriving and yeah, they do really, really well good stuff. And, yeah. You know, yeah it's cool to see so you've always kind of tried to you know get involved with those projects then basically well i try you know when i can like i said i i'm not gonna i'm not gonna change the world on my own but i, I do the little bit i can you know yeah i i don't have the biggest platform in the world but i have a little bit of one and yeah you know i'm kind of a big fish in a small pond and sometimes the pond gets a little bigger when we do stuff like this momentum movie brings I brings, guess more attention, more awareness to surfers. Brings more people in. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And what about, you, you also have like kind of other side projects that you do, right? Like businessy things. You've got, yeah. a, you've got a brewery as well, right? That you're involved well, with? I'm involved with another um, beer company again. Uh, that the same guy that started St. Archer, Josh, yeah. Josh Landon. Yeah. Uh, we started it. Well, we sold. We sold that company to Miller and Coors. Because Todd Riches is involved as well, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Todd's involved with the, uh, with the new one we're doing, which is called Harlan. Okay. What's the story there then? Yeah. So it's, 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 um, it's similar to St. Archer, but uh, we, this time we're, we have, we've learned a few things. Yeah. You know, from the first time well, around. Well, the first time went pretty well by the looks of it. Yeah. It went really well. Yeah. And and that uh, this time we also are we own a Scout distribution. Okay. So we have Harlan Beer, and then there's Scout, which is a distribution company. So we get to distribute not just our beer, but others' beer. Ah, uh, so you've stuff. got the you control in the yeah the, yeah the bigger operation. Yeah, and also um, with Josh is again is we started something called Villager. Okay. Which is um, organic coconut water, and it's organic kids meals that. You know, the, with the whole X Games um, genre of sports, be you know, being the you know, kind of the artwork and yeah. it's based around and just yeah. and healthy, you know, foods with less sugar in it. Yeah, you know, trying to take down the sugar levels of of, of what kids are intaking. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of in the culture. There's a lot of stuff pushed, which is not that isn't there yeah i mean there's some there's some stuff that's not good for you that yeah is being pushed pretty hard and it's just not good for the next generation you know yeah so have you do you bring kind of what you learned from the surf into these projects because presumably there's a lot of crossovers right and, yeah there's a ton of crossovers yeah. we have snowboarders and a lot of big time skaters involved and um I'm, I'm a very small part of it but i as on the surfing side you know i try to just bring um I don't know, my own personality and character to, to everything I do, which is um, hopefully 
people still look at me and think like he's surfing at a high level and that yeah, you know he's I reckon he's pretty fit you know <laughs> he's he's staying on the, on the ball with the, the program and yeah I, I mean if I get a lot of people now and they're you know guys are in their forties coming up to me and you know man keep it going like yeah right it's a whole another role model yeah a whole another <laughs> like set of fans are like my age and I you know I never even thought of before when I was young. Yeah, you know, having guys that old being on like, keep it going, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're doing it for us. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, um, nice. So, what else have you kind of? Well, I guess the question I'm going to ask is like, you've got this amazing overview of like the, the industry, like the competitive scene. Are you feeling positive about surfing right now when you look at it? I think there are positive things in surfing. I'm still. There are a couple of things where I'm a little bit hesitant about. I'm a little, just the industry, some of the companies, you know, things are, when I was coming up, Quicksilver was owned by, it was privately owned and Billabong was privately owned. Yeah. And, you know, all these companies are meshing together and they're all being owned by one big company. And, you know, I'm wondering how that's going to work out in the end. You know, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it's good or bad. I, you know, in the early 2000s, there was, I mean, if you surf decent or pretty good you were getting paid i mean everybody was getting paid right? yeah it was, bit of a golden age really. yeah it was it yeah. was a gold rush and then it was a bit it was too much you know it was probably an excessive amount but and then it and now it seems like it's swung the other way where yeah you know, really talented guys are finding it really hard to find a sponsor yeah i think that's across all of these kind of sports as well right you know like it's the, it's kind of weird as well right because they've, they've never been bigger like but but everyone seems to be doing a bit worse. Right. Yeah. That's what I don't understand. I mean, every time, every single day I turn on the show, on, on TV, there is surfing in multiple commercials. It's everywhere. It's yeah. everywhere. Like yeah. surfing itself is big. Yeah. But then, it's not. It's not trickling down to the surfers. Like, yeah, the money's going elsewhere. Yeah, it's going elsewhere. It's not going to. They're not using like top surfers in commercials. They'd better just pay you know model dude or whatever yeah you know i think i think i'd like to see that change yeah you know, i want to see i'd like to see you know like i don't know like john john in a rolex commercial or whatever it is you yeah know? <laughs> like yeah, to yeah. see them use like those kind of surfers and in, in, in what they're when they're going to advertise surfing or use surfing in something and um i'd like to see some of these guys get paid that are are really struggling guys on the ct and stuff that are struggling and yeah that's not right you know yeah. it's just not right that someone had spent their entire life to get to this point but it's it will see where the dust settles yeah you know, see how it settles it's an interesting time for surf the surfing industry but yeah it's a good time for surfing and the fact that we're in the olympics and you know there's been some changes you know, Pat O'Connell now is the commissioner. Yeah. At WSL. And, yeah. You're and thinking think, about that? I Most... think he'll he'll bring some good, fresh ideas. Yeah. I think he he came in with a plan, and I'm, I'm excited to see where it's going to go. Yeah, Because he's definitely. a really good friend of mine. Of and course, yeah. I, I get to give him a lot of shit now because he's commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's probably been getting a lot of that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just missed him, actually. We were going to speak to him for this, but yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah, he had to go. The snapper, huh? Yeah, exactly. And what about surfing itself? Obviously, we've been talking about the industry, but you must be pretty stoked on actual surfing right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, like watching John John just in the contest in the last couple of days, he's just ripping. And yeah, you got Gabriel doing his thing and Philippe. And, you know, it's it's such an exciting sport. I, I feel like it will make a big come push and come back around. It just, I think sometimes, I mean, you know, one of my favorite surfers is Griffin Colapinto now. I mean, because he brings that kind of energy, that like fun, you know, he's having a great time doing it, you know, not so, I don't, I like it gets, when it gets a little bit uh, monotone and robotic sometimes. Yeah, which can happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I want to see some more personality in it. Yeah. You know, some people flaring up, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And having a good time with it and, and maybe, you know, you can, talk smack if it's you know all good heartedness you know and yeah yeah healthy competition you know i don't think it's i don't think it's good to you know talk bad about anyone but you know just some good fun stuff like in the competition some good fun things and i don't know i'm just i hope 
there's more personality being brought out through their media sources. And I think, I think they are moving in that direction. I think, I think they know that too. Yeah. I think things are changing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about you personally? I mean, you said you want to keep progressing and that you, you want to keep getting better, but what, what's getting you stoked when you're surfing right now? Um, for me, it's always about going fast and turning hard. It's pretty simple, you know? Yeah. Like, um, you know, if I lose speed or, you know, I start to look stiff, that's when you can see a surfer kind of losing it. You know, yeah. like that's why you got to stay on top of the whole training regimen and stretching and all that. It's just like you said, you're getting older. Like, yeah. You need to work on it. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, and, and luckily I've been working on it this entire time. So I'm not, you know, I'm not that far off. I'm never that far off. You yeah. Know, I can get back to it where I need to be pretty quickly. Yeah. But um, for me personally, I, I like to do, I wouldn't mind doing some more alternative board stuff, you know, yeah, like Wi Fi with Bonzer. And yeah, because the, the Bonzer thing you've been experimenting with, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like to do some more of that. Um, and just, I'd like to go on some trips with, like, like I said, like with guys like Griffin. Yeah. Some of the young guys, you know, like, and, yeah. And just be on a trip with them, not so much to tell them what to do or anything like that, but just to kind of, feel them out you know and yeah. see what kind of questions they have and mm-hmm. you know to be in and all and i would be inspired by surfing with them and yeah you know it, it does bring whenever you see surfing from another person's point of view sometimes it can be really inspiring yeah exactly like shake it up for you give you that different perspective yeah exactly like whether it be you know it could be a griffin on tour it could be some some kid that's not on tour yeah you know We've got a really good young girl surfer over right that lives right here, and she's the best young girl surfer I've ever seen in my life. Really? Yeah. Who's that? Katie Simmers. Okay. And it's she's only thirteen, but it's wow. just amazing what she's doing. Like I've never seen, I haven't seen that kind of talent since Kelly probably. Wow. And High Lord. praise. Yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty. She's got a pretty good grasp of what's going on at thirteen. It's pretty wow. amazing. That's amazing. That's one thing we didn't have when we were growing up was you know 13 year olds boosting air ro- rotations and stuff yeah you know 13 i mean i think pat o'connell <laughs> said he started surfing at 13 yeah right yeah <laughs> and, and now 13 year olds are doing that yeah 13 year olds are yeah. doing the craziest stuff so i'm curious to see where all these young 12 13 year old rippers are going to like what kind of surfing they're going to be doing when they're 18 yeah jesus you just my, the mind boggles yeah it does yeah. i mean we look at with john john and you know dane reynolds and all these guys can do now and you think like wow is and that's can the, it actually get better than that and that's the standard though that's what they're aspiring to like right. 13 they're like well that's normal <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's nothing normal about it right? yeah I yeah mean, but that's okay that's what you need to do yeah wow. <laughs> well that's yeah i mean there you go progression progression and yeah. just seeing the stuff i just hope there's not i, I just want to get rid of all the soccer mom and dads in the sport yeah you know like well that's going to be interesting next year to see with the olympics you know because yeah. that, that can promote that unfortunately yeah it can um it can bring out the best in people and it can bring out the worst in people yeah but you think what you why do you say that you feel that's like damaging for it you just don't think it brings the right no i, I mean approach i to think it? kids like we had to find our own way we didn't none nobody in the momentum generation had a, a manager on tour a coach on tour no of course like, you know like you were you were getting the rent a car. You were getting the map and figuring out where the hotel was in yeah. Portugal. And you know, I want to see some of these kids figure it out. Yeah. Well, Not that's be imp- so spoon fed. Well, that's as important, isn't it? Those life skills that you learn from this, and it's all part of it, isn't it? Right. And it also, those are the experiences that build character. Yeah. And then that applies, as we've been saying, as you've been describing, to every area, doesn't it? Basically. Yeah. I mean that. You. I mean just a couple of years ago when I did that trip with um, Ben Howard and Mickey Smith to Ireland and Gabe and Lauren Davies. Yeah. The, the, the UK and Ireland connection. We yeah. It was about. crazy. We landed, we got the biggest storm that hit Ireland in three years. Yeah. We had four hours of sunlight in eight days. Like it was sounds just like, pouring on a sideways. Like, <laughs> sounds like Ireland. <laughs> yeah. And you know, nothing kind of went right for us, but God, man, we had some, amazing times on the trip where we were just laughing our asses off soaking wet like i remember we you know 
skin dog was there with us too yeah skinny was there and he's an epic human and we were there were times where we were we were, our clothes were so soaked we only had one i don't know we left our clothes at the other house and we were down the coast and we basically had on what we were wearing for three days and yep. soaking so everyone's got their clothes over the heater in in the hotel room everyone's walking around in their underwear up and down the <laughs> up and down the hallway and the girl the lady that was that owned the place was just going what is going on around here you know like, yeah it was just just stuff like that i mean that's what builds character yeah and those are the experiences you remember right right you know, those the, the, the you know what make it really yeah those are the times now that at the time we were kind of like bitching about it like god is it ever gonna stop raining you know yeah but now we look back at it and fuck it we made a pretty nice piece from it you know nice edit from it yeah considering everything that was going against us yeah and now we look back and we laugh our asses off and was like actually that was a really good trip yeah yeah it was really cool yeah yeah so on the subject of the you know like the state of surfing like the media thing is also like a kind of interesting crossroads magazines being closed like the the landscape changing so yeah how how are you feeling about that because you probably grew up with it all right yeah you know the whole with the magazines and everything it doesn't feel good it doesn't feel right that we lost surfing magazine and trans world and um i still love print you know i love something tangible yeah that i can hold and and look at and you know thank god there's you know there's still surfers journal and um, I'm really hoping that someday it comes back because when you look at just how legendary some of the people that worked at these places were, yeah, you know, what I- they've done. Iconic, like completely. Yeah, it's like we're those people were important just like the surfers were, you know, like the art brewers and the Jeff Devines. Yeah. And like, you know, it's I don't like seeing them not around surfing anymore. And I know that there's, you know, tons of new guys that are just killing it with the camera and and doing incredible things. But, you know, talking to those young guys, like they wish those other guys were around, too. Yeah. Like for me, I would love to go on a trip with, let's say, you know, Art Brewer and a Todd Glazer. Yeah. Complete. Because I know Todd would just be over the moon to sit down with and be around Art, you know, and and sure, Art's probably not swimming out at you know second reef pipe anymore but he doesn't have to yeah he's he's done it he did it way before anybody else did it yeah of course yeah and um he's earned his stripes you know like i'd just love to put him on some tropical beach and you know have todd (laughs) in the water and yeah you know and then just hear the stories hear them talking about photography i would love to be a fly on the wall to hear the young and yeah the older guys talk about what how they see things you know yeah. through the lens yeah sure because presumably it was a big part of your career as well like you know covers coverage like must be good memories linked to those things right oh yeah i mean you had to wait for it you're so excited when the you know the new mag hit yeah you know, and like run down the surf shop and you know the new mags out and um now everything is so instant yeah which is great you know i'm, I'm on instagram i'm as guilty as anyone but yeah there has to, like i said i think I don't think anything i don't think extremes are good to have in life you know like i don't think the extremes and the industry are good i don't think extremes as a person is good you never want to be extreme with alcohol or food or diet or you know yogis and you know like yeah you don't want to be extreme period so and like i feel like the industry is extreme where you know we're losing these iconic like parts of our tradition yeah and f- and for what i don't know you know the future is I, I don't know what it has in store for us but i know that it doesn't feel good to see these guys just start to step back away from our industry and be gone yeah you know i mean it's they have so much i mean think about it surfing a lot it's like half truth half meth yeah that is the surfing culture yeah it is. you know yeah you know the stories get bigger as the decades go on yeah and and it's unreal you know like you see the young guys glued to every you know every word when brock was telling a story you know i was you know like i was just like okay if you say that would happen then it happened yeah and you believed it and it made you want to go and go bigger you know like yeah 
to know that the guy, the generation before you were doing this and you're thinking to yourself, well, then I got to do that. You know, that's how, you know, that's how it was happening. It was happening in such a, and all those guys were there to, to film it and, um, take pictures of it. And you, I went from like having the photographer have to turn his film in, wait for the slides to come back Yeah. to now it's anyone with a digital camera. You know, it's just that it's just the nature of the beast right now. It's yeah. The, you know, but I asked, I just have, I have a feeling there's a way to have everyone involved. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how it impacts the culture, isn't it really? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see if, I mean, cause there's the new generation usually likes to rebel. Yeah. Kids like to rebel. They don't want to do what their parents are doing. Yeah. I didn't, you didn't. Nobody wanted to do what mom and dad were doing. Sure. So I'm wondering if, you know, kids now watching mom and dad glued to their phones and, you know, being complete glow faces. I wonder if the new generation will be like, you know what? Fuck this. Yeah. Like we're putting these things down. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I kind of hope so in a way. I, I would like to see everyone just kind of put it down for a minute and just be like, pay attention to what's around you, man. It, it's there's this nature and beautiful world that's going on and it's, it's going by without you noticing. Well, I got a final question for you, sure. which is, um, you know, goes back to what you were saying earlier about how you wanted to like pass on what you've experienced. And so if you could pass on like one piece of advice, what would that be from this, you know, overview that we've been talking about and this, this experience that you've accrued? Well, that would be, Never get far away from the feeling you had when you first fell in love with surfing. That's a great way to end it. Thanks, yeah. Taylor. Yeah, no problem. Matt. So there you go. That was me and Taylor Knox, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. We had a great time hanging out with Taylor and his family for the few hours we were there, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to our paths crossing once again at some point in the future. As a Grom who grew up idolizing Taylor and the boys, Owen Toes was absolutely frothing to go surfing with him dropping numerous heavy-handed hints, trying to find out where he was going to be during the imminent little blip of swell that was due to arrive later that day. In the event, it didn't happen as Taylor went out with his son. And judging by my performance when we did go surfing, that's probably quite a good thing for me. I'm blaming my arm, which I did hurt during the Alcatraz swim that I've talked about before on this podcast, and that I'd been ignoring during the rest of the trip, and which was completely buggered by the time we did end up in San Diego County and got a little bit of proper swell. Been to seeing the physio since I got back, who confirmed I've got tennis elbow and sore ligaments in my shoulders, and gave me a right proper time off for thinking I could just turn up in San Francisco with no training and bang out that Alcatraz swim. The words, you're in your 40s now, were uttered. And to be honest, he's right. Been ignoring these tweaks in my elbow for a good few months now, well, years actually, and it finally caught up with me. I think I'd know better really. Uh, the bad news is I'm definitely racking up what can only be described as middle-aged ailments as the years go on. So it's a summer of yoga and physio for me by the looks of it. Anyway, I just wanted to share another email in Housekeeping Corner that I got from another listener. I'm always asking for feedback. It's only right that when I do get them, I should share them, especially when they're this good. This one's from Colin McKenzie, who writes with a, a recommendation for a guest. There's one guy who I often wonder about for an interview. He's not exactly a household name and at his advanced years it might be a challenge. I originally hail from Scotland. It's a small nation and the skate community is even smaller but we have a father figure in his 80s who did so much for skateboarding in that wee part of the world. Notably his involvement with the legendary Livingston Skate Park. His name is Kenny Omond. I think that's how you say it. Livy appeared in the early 80s, just as most concrete parks were getting filled in. Visiting pros visited UK shores. It was a must for them to skate there. Where did these guys crash? Kenny's living room. For a small commuter town halfway between Edinburgh and Glasgow, bringing the likes of Hawk, Gons, Cardiel, to name a few. This little blip on the map punched well above its weight. The Livy comps of the 80s established Livy as a place of pilgrimage. Skate parks were few and far between, and for this one weekend every year, focused the entire community. It really was the centre of the skateboarding universe for those two days. Kenny himself has has had very little coverage in the media and it all happened years ago. He is no legend himself for such. That's not his style. He's all about the younger skaters. Livy is a legend and Kenny's a background figure, but a really important one in my opinion. His legacy helped generations discover the joys of concrete. I believe there's a story there, barely documented and almost out of reach. This guy deserves some props. 
it would be a challenge too if you're looking for one. Feel free to ignore the suggestion. Obviously, the bigger names will pull in more listeners. I just wish someone would get Kenny on record before it's too late. I'm sure I will continue to enjoy the show regardless. Firstly, thanks, Colin. That is a great email. I uh, really appreciated that. I mean, it's a great idea. It's exactly the type of thing this podcast should exist for. So thank you. Next time I'm in Scotland, I'll definitely be in touch to see if we can arrange it. If you do have any suggestions yourself, do let me know over at podcast at wearelookingsideways.com as Colin did or over at in my DMs at we look sideways on Instagram, which is what a lot of people seem to do. I should warn you, if you do get in touch with me over there, I tend to share them. So uh, yeah, get get contacting over there. All right, that's it for this week. I'll be back soon with a new episode. In the meantime, thanks for listening and I'll see you later. Nice one. <laughs>